that there'd be a stage here like this, otherwise I'd have done everything in song and dance form, but <laughs> you'll have to settle for just a talk. Awesome, so as uh, Laura said, I'm Arthur Maltzen, and I'm here to talk to you about Built With Love, why developer experience matters. And when I say developer, I don't just mean developers, I mean operators, designers, basically any technical tool user. So I'm just using developer as a shorthand here. And before we start talking about developer experience, I wanna start with something that's probably closer and, and more um, familiar, and that's user experience. And if we boil down and oversimplify user experience, the idea is to take an angry customer and apply a bunch of additional functionality, aesthetics, design, et cetera, and turn them into happy customers, right? And the thing is, if we look back, really not even that long ago, to 2005, the web used to look like this, right? And you know, since then, uh, something like MapQuest uh, now looks like this in the modern day, and you know, it's of course mobile friendly and, uh, and scales and so forth, right? But how did we get here? Did we just sprinkle a bunch of magic pixie dust on the website and turn it into this awesome experience? No, of course not. We did a bunch of research, which was then boiled down into knowledge that people then later took their, um, uh, their design and, and creative skills combined with engineering prowess to get to build these awesome experiences. But if you think about it, has the web fundamentally changed since 2005? I mean, we still have JavaScript, HTML, CSS. Yeah, JavaScript has classes now and CSS is more fancy, but fundamentally, the web of 2005 still had many of the same building blocks that we have today. What it really took was a perspective change that user experience is important and that we should invest in it. And you'll note, you know, I put up MapQuest and people are probably like, who the hell cares about MapQuest? But, <laughs> The thing is, if you look, in 2005 when Google launched, when Google Maps launched, it wasn't that drastic of a difference. Yeah, it didn't have traffic and so forth, but the thing is Google had made the perspective change that user experience is important and building on the same core technologies that Map, MapQuest was using, they were able to build a much better experience. And the question is, why did this change, right? What was the drastic change since then and now? Well, many companies found that with a little bit of investment, they saw a huge increase in usage, which then led to a big return on investment, right? And a company that saw this really early on, way before the dawn of the internet, was Apple, right? With their famous 1984 presentation, they looked at the commercial, they looked across the industry and saw all those beige, boring PC boxes and said, we need to do something different. We need to have something that's not only more aesthetically pleasing, but also something that is more functional, right? Steve Jobs always talked about that it's, just not, it's not just aesthetics, it's also the functionality. And it's of course not just Apple that knows this, right? Google talks about how in the first 50 milliseconds, a customer will get a gut feel for what your website is like and whether to trust it or not. And my favorite quote uh, in this research by IBM, they talked about how with every dollar invested in ease of use, they saw a 10 or $100 return on investment. Right, so that's user experience, right? Looking back a bit of more than a decade, we see it all of the value we kind of left at the table by not investing in user experience. So the question is, what are we missing out on today by not investing in developer experience? And I'm gonna argue, and before we get there, you might be wondering, well, okay, what is developer experience? And again, if we boil it down, it's taking an <laughs> angry developer who's not happy with the tool that they're using, applying a bunch of techniques, some of which we'll talk about here, and turning them into happy users, right? Happy developers. And you know, someone who saw this early on, uh, you all know the famous Steve Ballmer uh, developers. I'm not gonna hopefully get that sweaty uh, on stage. So what are we missing out on by not focusing on developer experience today? Well, I'm gonna argue we're missing out on three key things. The first is fiscal. 
The next is mental energy. And the last is developer morale or decrease in morale. So let's look at each one individually. So developers, you know, in this field, and again, I'm using developers as a shorthand, technical professionals generally make pretty good money, right? Like all things considered, this is a good field to be in. And obviously a team of developers costs a lot of money. And if you think, and if you have a team of developers spending most of their time, uh, two, two weeks, for example, configuring their workstation, well, that's a huge investment in not working on the product and adding new features, right? So that's the fiscal side. Let's look at the mental energy. There's a really good analogy out there about representing everybody's mental energy as, say, in the form of coins. And every day, depending on how you're feeling, you wake up with a different set of coins that you can spend on decisions and actions. Now, for uh, many of you here in the US, you might be wondering, what the heck are those? Uh, those are called uh, loonies. They're the dollar coin in Canada. Uh, they're called loony because they have a loon on them. They might also be loony, I'm not sure. Uh, fun fact, we also have toonies, uh, but I digress. Back to the coin analogy. Uh, so the idea is every time you make a decision or get frustrated by something and, and have to get distracted and diverted, you're spending a coin. And somebody who saw early on the importance of this and optimizing your decision making is Steve Jobs, right? One of the things that um, they talk about in his biography is he wore the black turtleneck and, jean jack and, and jeans every day. That was all he had so that he didn't have to spend decision energy on what he's gonna wear that day. So next time you run into an error and you have to Google it on Stack Overflow, that's a coin, right? Maybe you bang your head against a missing semicolon for three hours and hey, you just spent a whole bunch of Right, so having that poor developer experience really forces you, or makes you spend a lot of uh, mental energy. And the last one is morale, right? Every time we start in a new company or on a new project, we're often really excited. We're gonna work on something new and build something exciting, and as the poor developer experience of the tools we use continues to grind on us, eventually we're just ready to <laughs> punch right through a machine, right? So that's kind of the morale aspect of a poor developer experience, right? So again, not investing in developer experience today is costing us, at least from my perspective, fiscal, mental energy, and morale. All right, but what do we do about it, right? Okay, cool, that sounds great, but what do we do? Well, there's a lot we can do. And before we start looking at what we can do, we need to break down developer experience into two main categories. The first category is developer experience of you as a tool author building tools for other developers to use it. And the second kind of major facet is working with other developers on a project. So the developer experience of working on a project together. And the reason I split these into two main categories will become more evident as we look at the specific uh, implementation and improvements. And if we look at how do we improve it, we need to look at the experience life cycle. And what I mean by that is from the start of using a project or starting to work on a project with somebody else to maybe making that first commit or making that first change to your day-to-day -day interactions on the tool and finally to the retirement because you know everything kind of comes to an end at some point. And we often don't talk about that. So. So, everything we're gonna talk about today, all the concepts are gonna be translatable whether you're a front-end developer, a back-end developer, or working on DevOps tooling. The specific implementation is gonna be different, obviously, depending on the tool, but the concepts should be translatable. And finally, the lens that we need to take every time we're trying to improve developer experience is one of empathy. I really love this um, graphic from, this comic from Grammarly that kind of distinguishes sympathy and empathy. We don't wanna say, yeah, that sucks, and then kind of leave it at that. We wanna say, yeah, that sucks, and let's work together to improve it. That's, that's the heart of developer experience, is, improve, is bringing empathy to our customers and to ourselves as well. 
All right, let's get concrete. Let's put on our steel-toed boots. Let's talk about a specific problem that we're gonna solve together and improve developer experience. And that problem is pair programming. And uh, my daughters love pair programming uh, regularly. And, and as you probably know, one of the big problems with pair programming is getting that proper attribution, those sweet, sweet green GitHub squares, right? Like you're sitting with somebody else, how do you get attributed for the pairing that you're doing? Well, there's a lot of tools out there today, and one of them is called PairUp. PairUp's been around for a while, and the way it works kind of quickly boils down, it changes Git's uh, Git author name and author email and the Git committer name and email to the different people that are pairing. Now, as you can probably tell, one of the problems with that is gonna be you can only pair, because there's only two uh, switches there in Git. So you can't mob program, and it also doesn't accurately represent how the work is being done, right? It's not saying two people authored it, it's just saying a committer and an author. Fortunately, about a year and a half ago, GitHub released a, 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 an, a feature that's actually um, now considered a standard within the Git community, where you add this comment trailer that says co-authored by, and that attributes the commits to multiple authors. And the best part of that is that you can actually do as many co-authored commits as you want. We've mobbed up to 12, 14 people, and it works beautifully. So the challenge is pair up doesn't support this, right? So what we're gonna do together, and again, this is I'm just using this as an example, as a scaffold to show you how to improve developer experience. We're gonna build a new tool that replaces pair up for mob programming and uses this co-authored by concept. Now the first thing we need to build a new tool is a snazzy name. What can we call it? Well, let's just go with mob up, whatever. <laughs> let's keep it simple. All right, so we're gonna talk about improving or building mob up together and looking at how to improve the developer experience and the experience throughout the experience lifecycle. And we're gonna start with working together. So, when we get started, one of the first things we feel when we open up a new code base and we're working together on something like MobUp is, where the hell am I, right? Like, it's a new code base. Where, how does the code interact? How does data flow through the system? This is often a big problem. So how do we improve this developer experience? Well, we can use sequence diagrams. I know, a little old school UML, whoa, really? But with a light touch of a sequence diagram, we could model something like pair up, like this, where we can model the interaction and the collaboration of classes or, or objects or whatever you want to call them across the data flowing through the system. And you might bemoan, oh, I have to open up MS Paint and start drawing this. Well, fear not. You can actually model all of this as code using a plugin or a tool called PlantUML. And my favorite part is PlantUML even has a VS Code plugin that automatically renders the sequence diagram as you go. So awesome developer experience getting started on a new code base with somebody else would be to have uh, data flow diagram showing you how data flows through the system and how the classes interact. All right, moving on. We're ready to make our first commit and our first pull request. And even if we have the build all working locally, this is still kind of a nervous action, right, to make that first pull request. You're not sure what's expected of you. Did I miss anything, et cetera? Well, this is where a really cool feature in GitHub and also GitLab and a bunch of others have it uh, called pull request templates. And using pull request templates to model a checklist that looks something like this. And you know, as humans, filling out checklists is super gratifying. So we can really help guide not only new contributors, but also old hats to remind them what are the things that you might have missed. So having an awesome first commit experience, consider adding a pull request checklist. Moving on. 
to our day-to-day -day interactions working together on a tool like MobUp. What does that look like? Well, one of the first things to kind of help improve working together, once, you've, once you have a team that's larger than a couple people, is it's really hard to keep track of what's happening, what's been changing, right, recently. And one of the things that has helped people a lot over the years is writing a change log. Now, writing change logs are pretty frustrating. Please don't take out that frustration when you write the change log. Um, <laughs> Uh, but one of the things that's frustrating with writing a change log is the same thing that's frustrating with writing a readme. You have a blank sheet of paper. What do you do with it, right? It's not actually paper, but you know what I mean. Um, so fortunately, there's a lot of really good guides out there, and my favorite is keep a change log. And once you have some structure, it's actually pretty easy to start to fill out um, what's been changing. And for a tool like MobUp, keeping a change log isn't only helpful for all of us and for anybody new who's come to see what's changed, but it also helps our users to know what's happening and what's changing. All right. So having an awesome day-to-day -day experience, keep a change log. So last part. No matter how much we work on something, at some point it's going to be retired. You know, this isn't something that we often think about. But one of the big things with retiring a code base is even if we're kind of disappointed and, and sad that it's changing, um, if we just leave the project as is, in the future, somebody might stumble on it and think, hmm, this is an interesting chest of information. And they might open it up and say, whoa, look at all this code that I can start using. And they're getting excited. They maybe make a pull request to it, and nobody's responding, and they're just sad, right? So how do we tie up our project and retire it in a nice, clean fashion? Well, the first thing is, aside from clearly marking it as deprecated, one of the things that I think that's very valuable to do is to make sure to close off all the open pull requests and issues. That shows that the project isn't currently active, right, because people can get quickly confused, but the other aspect of doing that is to keep the code in a clean state. Not only because you might come back to it a year or two in the future, who knows, right? Maybe MobUp will become popular again and we'll want to um, add to it, but also because as developers, we often go back and copy paste our old code. And if we keep that old code in a good working state, that makes it easier for us and it makes it uh, obvious to other people that it's not in use. And the other big one is archive the project, right? Many of the today's um, source control systems have this feature. You just archive it and mark it as read-only. So having an awesome developer experience uh, retiring the project, we want to leave the code in a good working state, and we want to archive it. So let's look over how do we have an awesome developer experience working together on a tool like MobUp? First, we have um, a data sequence diagram to get started, a pull request checklist, keeping a change log, and leaving the code in a good state. Awesome. So let's move on to the next aspect. And that is improving the developer experience working as a tool author for the people that are working on our tool. And before we do that, we're gonna have to do a tangent. I know, hold on, bear with me, but we need a tangent to determine what kind of tool we're gonna build. And my argument is we should build tools that meet developers where they're at. You know, in their mother's basement, wait, no. I mean, at a Star Trek conference, or no, no. I mean, you can find developers there, but what I really mean is meeting developers where they're at in terms of the tools that they're using. And that's day to day, they're in their text editor or IDE of choice, and they're usually running and testing their application in their terminal of choice, right? So if we think long and hard, if we're building a new tool for developers, do we start GUI first or do we start CLI first, right? So if we're gonna meet developers where they're at, my argument is we start CLI first. And 
One of the arguments is starting with CLI first does not preclude building a UI later, but starting with a UI first often, lead, often precludes building a CLI afterwards. And as developers, we're probably working on web apps most of the time, so we feel more comfortable in that realm. But when we use tools, like think about it, the tools that you're using to build those web apps are usually CLI tools, right? So like, let's, be, let's have that empathy and meet developers where they're at. And if we start CLI first, the best part is we can have developers start using it right away, right? And um, if we build that CLI on a well-factored code base, we might have another developer who joins who's really interested in the internals of MobUp, and she might build a web app for a business user to use, right? So something like a business user who wants to see who's mobbing and how long are they mobbing, mob programming for. Sometime later, you might build an IDE plugin, like that's VS Code or whatever, that's built on top of the CLI, which brings in a whole bunch of other new developers who maybe then build an Electron app for that more advanced business user to slice and dice the data, right? So the point is, starting CLI first kind of gives you the best of both worlds because you can start to meet developers where they're at, but it does not preclude you from building it later on. So, with that tangent out of the way, let's look at how to improve the developer experience as a tool author for other people using our tool. So, getting started with a new tool is often a frustrating experience because we're looking to figure out how to install the tool, right? That's our first interaction. And if you provide your developer with a big checklist of install this programming language, these dependencies, et cetera, well, guess what? Uh, they're not gonna be very happy. So, again, we're bringing empathy, we're trying to meet developers where they're at, and that means providing our tool in a packaging that developers are familiar with, something like a homebrew package, uh, native package, or as the um, SecOps in the room probably think, the curl bash install, the devil's tool. So. Um, and you know, if you're not sure why, it's because uh, people are just executing bash scripts without looking at what's actually happening. But anyway, um, all of those install methods are really great if your tool fits into a nice binary package that's easy to install cross-compile uh, across OSs, and usually if you've built the tool in Golang or Rust. If you've built the tool in something else like Python or Ruby, like many tools are built, the installation process might be a bit more fraught with peril. So, how do we solve that? How do we make a really awesome developer experience regardless of the tool you build it in? Well, I it would, wouldn't be a DevOps conference if I didn't bring up Docker. We take our tool and we package it into another tool, and you might be wondering, huh, how does that make anything better? But if we throw a little shell script on top of our image, all of the sudden, we can provide this shell script as the executable, and it feels and behaves just like a CLI, but under the hood, it's running an image. And we found this super valuable, especially if you need OS-level dependencies that are notoriously difficult to compile and install. This is a really great way to package your tool, and guess what, it's cross-platform uh, cross and works the same way on any OS. So, that's how we make an awesome getting started experience with our tool. So package it in, or meet developers where they're at with a one-liner install, and if it's not easy to install, use Docker. So moving on to that first experience of using the tool. So when we use the tool, I like to think of that as first contact, right? That's our first interaction, and just like the first commit, first contact is often I don't know, is this gonna work or not? And so what we need to do is we need to take the nervous part out of that by helping guide the user with that initial interaction. So imagine if instead of the way pair up works today, we ask the user for all of the details of how to configure and pair with somebody. What if instead, as an awesome developer experience, we do the work on the user's behalf and we go and talk to, say, a GitHub API or whatever internal API and get their full name and email, right? So again, we're 
taking the nervous part out of it, we're guiding the users through it, and we're making it a much nicer and cleaner experience. So that's how we make an awesome developer experience for that first commit, by doing the work on the user's behalf. Moving on to the day-to-day. -day. So what is the best way to make developers frustrated in their day-to-day -day interaction with your tool? It's by having bad error messages, right, that don't help guide you. Now, many of you have probably seen these kind of error messages, right, from the git command line, and you might be wondering, wow, not only is it telling me exactly what's wrong, but it also tells me what to do. How do, can I actually do that myself? Well, the answer is yes, and the way we do that, and I'm not sure if this is the way git, GitHub has implemented it, but the way that we can do that is using something called Levenstein distance, which is a very simple, or, oh, not so simple mathematical formula, but before you throw me off the stage, let's look at an example. So a Levenstein distance formula, what it does is it takes two words and you plug it into this algorithm and it plots a number. So in this example, I know it's a bit hard to read, um, we start with the word kitten and we're seeing what the Levenstein distance is to sitting. And it's three because we change three characters in the word kitten and it becomes sitting. And you might be wondering, oh my God, do I have to implement this myself? No, you don't. Many programming languages, if you look it up, Levenstein distance is implemented at least a dozen times. So we can pull a tool off of, off of the internet, because, you know, of course, and um, we can use it in a Levenstein, we can use it in our CLI to do something like this. So for example, configurations are often fraught with uh, typos and other errors, right? And most tools just explode and say, oh, something's wrong, right? So instead of just exploding and saying something's wrong, we can actually take, we, we know what the keywords are for our configuration, right? We know we need name, we need email, we need timeout, whatever else, right? There's a finite set of keywords. And then if the user misconfigured something, we just run a Levenstein distance against each of those keywords. Whichever one is closest, we say, hey, consider this one. And now we have useful error messages that guide you how to improve it. And we can do this with MobUp and make that awesome developer experience in our day-to-day -day interaction, catching errors and guiding users how to improve it. All right, so remember, empathy. Finally, regardless of the blood, sweat, and tears we put into our tool, at some point it's gonna be retired. So how do we improve the retirement of our tool for other users? Oftentimes, tools are retired because there's another tool that's replacing it. So for us as the tool author, our role, our um, kind of, what we need to do for our users is to provide that bridge to that next tool. So you might look, okay, there's three other tools that replace the tool we're using. Make the evaluation, find the one that you think is the best for your users, and clearly communicate that that's the tool to go to. But to take it up a notch, we should do the migration for the user, right? So if we deprecate something like MobUp, we would say when you use it, hey, I'm sorry, MobUp is deprecated. Here, read this blog post on why. We've identified something like GitMob, which is another open source project, uh, as the replacement. And hey, by the way, do you want me to do the migration for you? and then guide the user to the next step of getting started with it, right? So that's how we make a graceful retirement for the tool we're working on as a tool author, right? So again, clear and automated migration off of the tool. So how do we make an awesome developer experience as a tool author? Well, we provide one-liner installs that use Docker when needed. We make the, um, uh, we do the work on the user's behalf. We can use Levenstein distance calculations to improve our error messages. And finally, we provide an automated and clear migration path. All right, that was a whirlwind tour. That was a lot to cover. Let's do a quick replay of what we just did. So we started off with user experience and talking about how over the last decade, we've missed out on a lot by not focusing on user experience. We then discussed what are the various uh, aspects of, uh, that we're missing out on by not focusing on developer experience today. 
monetary, mental energy, and morale. We saw some tactical, specific ways to address developer experience working together and working on the tools so other developers who are using it. So really, I ask you, what are you waiting for to improve developer experience today? Take one or two of these tips, apply them, and turn your angry developers into happy developers. I'm Arthur Maltzen. I work at uh, Capital One as uh, um, and uh, thank you. Uh, we, we are hiring, we're opening a Boston office, so I'm just gonna quickly plug that, and I will post this version of the slides uh, there on the slide share. Uh, other links, MobUp is an empty repo right now, so if you go to it, maybe at some point I'll work on it. Um, so, thank you. Any questions? I yeah, think we have, you have like a couple minutes. minutes. Two minutes. The so the, the question was, uh, what, what library do they, does the person recommend for building CLI? Uh, so personally, we use a lot of Python. Uh, Click is a really awesome CLI library. I know for Golang, which we hope to go to later, um, has Cobra, which is really great. Um, I do think if you're starting out super small, just start with what's built in. But it, as, long, as soon as you start to get into a more complex library, highly recommend um, using, or sorry, uh, more complex CLI, highly recommend using a library for that. All right, well, thank you everybody. Really appreciate it. As I said, I'll post the slides here. Feel free to come and uh, talk to me after the talk or meet me at the conference. Thank you so much.